God's house today. Isn't this exciting to worship the Lord? Generally speaking, how would you describe your life? Would you say that you are a person with a pessimistic outlook or a positive outlook on life? And then let me ask you a deeper question. How would your friends describe you? As someone who is optimistic and positive or someone who is pessimistic and negative? And let me drill just a little deeper. How would your family describe you? Would they say, generally speaking, you are a positive person or a pessimistic person? Well, I pray that God would help us all be positive. And today, if you have a copy of the Word of God, we're going to learn how to have a positive, passionate attitude based on Scripture from Psalm 150. Psalm 150, page 449. If you don't have a Bible, please take the one on the seat tray in front of you, open it up, and let's follow along in the Word of God together. We'll get to our text in just a moment. But one of the things I love about going up to the farm in Kentucky is an opportunity to just to kind of hang out. And there's a group of guys, kind of like a breakfast club, who meets at the landing every morning around 7 o'clock, 7.30. The landing is simply a convenience store kind of out in the country. It's got the gas pumps and, you know, a few items. And then on the back of it, there's a little cafe there and, of course, an opportunity to have some type of breakfast or for lunch, a sandwich. So it's kind of a neat place. And there's a group of guys, kind of, again, kind of like a breakfast club, who gets there just about every morning, rain or shine, snow or sleet. If the roads are travelable, they, they're, they're there. If you can get on the road, they're there. And uh, everybody there has a nickname. Now, you might be thinking, well, what do they call you? Well, I'm that preacher from Florida. That's my nickname, all right? Everybody's got a nickname there, and one of the guys who gathers at that breakfast table is named Critical. They nicknamed him Critical, because no matter what subject you bring up, everybody can be excited. Boy, isn't it a beautiful day outside? Yeah, but it's going to rain this afternoon. Boy, it's so exciting to see, and no matter what you say, negative, 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 critical, 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 brings a subject up, and he is going to criticize the people that you are discussing or the situation in life that you're discussing. He's just critical. True story. Critical. Critical. A pessimist. Drive, I don't know, probably about 15 miles up the road. Go up to Sand Cap which I got to do just a few days ago when we were on vacation. Got to visit with my friend, Pastor Wayne. Pastor Wayne's got polio, a myriad of health issues, has a very, very, very meager income. This is with Pastor Wayne there in his home. As soon as I got there, he, he stood up to greet me, and he's, he's crippled from polio, and again, health is bad, but but as soon as he saw me, what's up? How are you doing? Good to see you. Come on in the house. It was raining outside. We went in and we sat down. What you has been up to? Well, we started talking and telling. Well, the thing I know of Pastor Wayne is he pastor San Gap United Baptist Church. It had six people four years ago, and probably this morning they'll have 40 to 50 people gathering to worship. And San Gap is a spot on the road. San Gap is where on Tuesdays, because God burdened him, because there's so many people there who are who don't have a whole lot, that they should provide at least one hot meal for them a week. So on Tuesdays, uh, he provides lunch, he and the volunteers from the church, for about 150 to 200 people. And he said, I never know where the money's coming from. God always provides. He said, in fact, quote, I ain't good for nothing but giving things away. And when he said that that day, just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I thought, Lord, I want to be like Pastor Wayne. Pastor Wayne is positive, optimistic, man. He laughed. He had me laughing. He, he was just going on and on, story after story after story about seeing how God is working, how God is moving there in their church, people whose needs are being served, situations that are difficult, but yet he is so positive. Now, I don't know about you, 
But I'd a whole lot rather be like Pastor Wayne than I would be a light critical. Anybody else like that? Yeah. And today we're going to learn from God's Word because this is the key. The key to having a positive attitude and outlook on life is understanding who God is, what He has done, and what He is doing, and how He is going to safely bring you through whatever is going on in your life. That's the kind of God we serve. Positive, faith-filled. Just yesterday afternoon, I was talking to some different people on the phone, and I talked to one of our dear members who's been here for many, many, many years, and Joe Henniger, and of course her husband Cheryl's got a number of issues. And as we talked about the different challenges they have, she said, well, you know, Pastor, there's a lot of people who've got it a whole lot worse off than we are. God's taking care of us. He's going to continue to take care of us. That, my brothers and sisters, is a faith-filled, optimistic, positive attitude. That's the kind of attitude I know all of us here at First Sarasota want to have. Now, I might be saying, well, how do I have that? Glad you asked. Psalm 150. Is a great psalm. It's, it's concluding a hymn book, a bunch of songs, all kinds of songs in the book of Psalms. But Psalm 150 is one of my favorite songs because 13 different times there is a directive, there is a command, listen carefully, that is the secret to having a positive, faith-filled attitude in life no matter if you're walking on the mountaintops of victory or in the valley of defeat, we're going to see it right here in Psalm 150. If you found your place in the Word of God, say, I've got it. Look at it, please. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with the resounding cymbals. Read this out loud, please, this last verse with me passionately. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, today we're going to learn how to do that privately, personally, and also corporately. Because this is the secret. Praise is the fuel for having a positive attitude in life. Did you know that there are more commands in Scripture regarding praising God than praying to God? Now, should we pray? Absolutely. But here's the thing. You can pray without praising, but you cannot praise without praising. Praying, because when you praise, you are praying, you are, you're, you're giving God glory, because prayer is what takes place when I'm asking God for something. Praise is what takes place when I'm giving God something. Now, here's the thing our text teaches. God alone deserves praise. He desires praise, and at least 13 times in this one short chapter, in six verses in Scripture, we are commanded to praise. Now, I got it. I've been around a long time. Now, for about 59 plus years, I've been blessed to be attending Baptist churches. Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I'm dead, I'll be Baptist dead. I got it, all right? I got it. I know. I got it. And I can just think of somebody right now thinking something like this. Well, John, we know you grew up in the country, but you are at the First Baptist Church. I don't know about you, but it doesn't matter what the sign says outside. The Bible says we're to praise God. And one of the many things I love about First Sarasota is this is a church that loves to praise Jesus. This is a church that is alive and well. I love it. But I know there might be some. And here's another thing. You know, I'm just not very emotional. I just don't get emotional at all. Well, that's a whole other story about another time. The same guy who's probably saying that gets pretty emotional if someone sits in his pew at church. But let me just keep on. Oh, I didn't struck a nerve. That's not even what the mess that was even in my notes. Let me just talk to you about this. Seriously. I don't, I don't get emotional. Well, my wife and I, when we were away on vacation, also spent about a week in Clayton, Georgia, northeast Georgia. Beautiful, beautiful place. And they were assembling a county fair. There in northeast Georgia, while we were there, we didn't go, but I did the next best thing. We drove by it a couple of times. But um, 
But I was reminded of that about a man who went to the county fair with his wife. He's an old farmer, and he and his wife, uh, you know, didn't get out a whole lot, and he was kind of tight, and he, too, was not emotional, never got excited about anything, just kind of a, you know, just kind of a you know, flat line, just kind of guy. And they, they, at this county fair, though, they had an airplane that was an open cockpit. So, so you got one of these biplanes, you know, with the two wings, and it's an open cockpit. So you got two places, actually three places, in the cockpit, and, and you could get a ride for, for $25. Now, this was a long time ago. Of course, it'd be probably 250 now. And the pilot was trying to coax them to getting into the plane and flying. The farmer said, no, 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 and I won't do that. $25, that's too much. Ain't no way. Can't do it. Finally, the pilot said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will take you and your wife for a flight. And if you don't say a single word while we're up in the plane, I'll not charge you $25. The fellow thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. So they got in the plane, they took off, sure enough, they get high in the sky, and this pilot is going up, going down, sideways, upside down, any and every way you could turn that plane, trying to get a reaction out of that farmer, and that farmer was silent, wife screaming, but that farmer was silent. I mean, seriously, I mean, just not a word. They landed the plane, got out of the plane. The pilot said to the farmer, I can't believe this. I did everything I could to get a response out of you. And the farmer said, we almost did. The pilot said, when? He said, when my wife fell out. Now, (laughs) some people just aren't going to respond no matter what. But this text today reminds us that it is positive to praise, and praise is positive. So what are we supposed to do? Psalm 150, verse 1, read it aloud with me. Praise the Lord. Say it again. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heaven. So again, 13 times along, we are commanded to pray. Now that word praise, that word praise comes from two Hebrew words that, that are very, very important. Halal and Yah. Halal and Yah, which we all know the word hallelujah, which is one that is common in just about any and every language you go to, they say hallelujah the same way. Halal and Yah, halal means to brag, Yah refers to God. So every time we say hallelujah, we're saying praise the Lord. That is the original word there in this command to praise the Lord. So let me just ask you a question. Do you have anything to brag on God about in your life from this past week? Anybody got anything to brag on God about this morning? Come on, talk back to me. Because if you don't, first of all, you can just praise God for who He is because He says, who we're to praise? Praise the Lord. Praise Him. So we're supposed to focus. This is so very important. We're supposed to focus our story on his story, and when we become part of his story, he will use our story to tell his story. Now, let me tell you something. You're not going to use his story to tell your story because God will not be used. But if you will allow God, God will take the story of your life that he is writing right now and make it part of his story and bring him great glory. Because here's the thing. Today as we gather, you're not the audience. Our wonderful choir, orchestra, Pastor Sean, these singers, all this beautiful music. As they were singing, no offense, you are not the audience. As I am preaching this book, the Word of God, that never changes and brings hope and life that is alive. I'm not preaching to you. I, we, they, you, all of us right now are rather in the very presence of a holy, righteous, just, pure God. He is all of our audience, and all of our life is to be lived to glorify, to magnify, to make much of Him. That, my friend, is what it's all about. And when I am positive, and when I am praising Him, then that praise fuels my passion for God, and you can't think about God without being positive. He says, praise the Lord. Again, God is the audience. Now, mistakenly, 
We oftentimes think that all the people around us, our audience, are, if you're on social media, then you think of the platform that you have, whether you have a a hundred followers or a hundred thousand or a hundred million followers. In today's world, that is often called your platform. Well, let me share something with you. Our goal in life should not tend to be how many likes, shares, clicks, or comments that we may or may not get on any post that we make. That's another subject for another time because most of the posts that many of us make focus on ourselves. The platform that we have been allowed to live on is the one of Holy God. He is our audience and we want His name to be famous in Sarasota and beyond. Praise the Lord. He is who we're to praise. Now you might be thinking, well, what about those around me? Don't I want to make them happy? Well, here's the thing. If you will please and honor God, the people around you who love you and certainly who love the Lord are going to be forever grateful that He is the one that you're focusing on. There may be some people around you who don't like the fact that they are not your priority. But here's the secret. If you will love God the most, you can always love everyone else the best. And the psalmist says here, praise the Lord. He is who we're to praise. Now, where do we praise him? Verse 1 again, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Now, the phrase sanctuary, of course, there refers to the Old Testament temple. And it was in the temple that the very presence of God dwelt in Old Testament times there in the Holy of Holies. And that was the place the people went to worship God. Today, we are blessed to wear as followers of Jesus Christ because of what Jesus did on the cross when he shed his blood for your sins, my sins, the sins of all humanity, for all of human history. He makes it possible for our heart to be his home for our bodies, in essence, to be a house where God dwells. First Corinthians six nineteen. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He's talking about the very Holy Spirit of God living with you. You are not your own. Verse 20, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. Verse 31, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all, say it with me, please, for the glory of God. So no matter what I do, where I am, in essence, as a fall of Christ, I'm to bring glory to God. Should I bring Him glory when we gather here in His house? Absolutely, positively. And whether we're singing a song, preaching a sermon, teaching a Bible study lesson, taking care and teaching preschoolers about Jesus or teaching young kids about Jesus or students about Jesus. We do it for the glory of God because all of life is to worship Him. So let me just explain this perhaps in a way that can take our corporate worship experience, that is what we're doing right now, to the next level and take your daily life to the next level. Here it is. If I will spend time with the Lord every single day, preferably in the morning, and there's nothing legalistic about that. It's just that Jesus spent time with his Father in the morning. The psalmist said, early in the morning will I seek you. In my own life, that's a great way to set the the, the tempo for the rest of the day. But whenever you can, spend time with the Lord. This is what happens. The more you focus on him, the smaller everything around you becomes. Because the greater... Your love, your adoration, your respect for the greatness, the glory, the grandeur, the goodness of God is, the smaller all the things that are taking place around you become. And so when I'm fretting and when I have fears personally, and like you, I struggle with those, I'm reminded that I've got my focus in the wrong place. The text here says, praise the Lord. And praise Him in His sanctuary. And then He goes on to say, praise Him in the heavens. And the fact of the matter is, is that some scholars believe that basically, in many ways, what that's saying is, wherever you are in the sanctuary, in the heavens, anywhere on earth, ultimately, you are simply to praise Him. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So if you want to take your daily worship to the next level, 
And if you want to have a positive attitude and a positive out- outlook on life, and see every situation that you deal with in that day, whether it be getting a parking ticket, or whether it be sitting down for a scrumptious lunch, or perhaps you find yourself in a long line at the UPS store, whatever it might be, or you go to the office, or you go to the doctor, and you get some bad news. When I realize and recognize that I'm living for the audience one, please don't miss this, it changes my attitude and my actions, and I can respond in a positive, passionate fashion, trusting my all-loving Heavenly Father that He is working for my good and for His glory in and through whatever is happening in that moment, whether I see it as good or bad or not, because I want to praise the Lord. And I will glorify God no matter what I'm doing. But that's me personally. But let me talk to you about our corporate gatherings. That is what we're doing right now. And I want to thank you for being here today. This is a great attendance in, in the middle of the summertime. Let me, just, let me just say this to you. The way we take our corporate worship to the next level with being passionate about who God is, grateful to be in His presence, The way that happens is if I realize and recognize that personally, all week long, I have been praising God. I've been focusing on Him, and I'm positive that believing that He is at work in my life 24-7, 365, no matter what I'm dealing with, then when I come to God's house, guess what happens? If I'm doing that and you're doing that, look out, we're going to have some church, as we like to say, in the country. God's going to show up. God's going to show off because we don't come to worship. Listen carefully. We ought to come worshiping. So when I'm driving to church, I should be worshiping. You're like, well, I cut three drivers off on my way to church. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to be here. I'm glad you were, but you might want to ask the Lord to forgive me for cutting those people off. But you understand, right, what I'm saying. I come worshiping because this is what the Bible says in John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to a woman who, of her own admission, was far from God. Now, she didn't know about the one true God. She was worshiping the the, the Samaritans' gods in the mountains, and she's quizzing Jesus. We often call her the woman at the well. There in John chapter 4 about the gods, and, and he's trying to explain to her who God is and who he is. And there's a conversation taking place, another mess for another time, that's really powerful. But she said, you know, our fathers worship God in the mountains. Jesus said to her in John 4, yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers, say these three words with me, please. The Father seeks. Now, let me just camp out there for a moment. He says you worship in spirit and truth. And notice it's not Holy Spirit capitalized there. He's talking about passion. So when we gather to worship, God wants us passionately in love with Him, but it's got to be in line with the truth of His Word. If you got it, say, I got it. Now, here's the challenge. Some people swing so far on the emotional side that they're, as the old saying goes, a mile wide and an inch deep. Or for some of us who've been around for a while, man, they kind of got out of hand. On the other hand, there are some of us who are so concerned about the truth that we go deeper and deeper. We go down deep, stay down long, and come up dry. Are you with me, church? And it seems as if the truth is for information only, not for application and transformation. Jesus said, no, 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 no. When you gather, it needs to be passionate And it needs to be truthful, truthful and passionate. That's the kind of worship the Father seeks. So uh, imagine with me, please. I know God is everywhere all the time. I got that theological truth. I understand that. But there's something incredible in Scripture and probably in your life experience as well where God just seems to manifest His presence among His people, and it seems as if God is in the house. I know this for a fact. 
when a church gets that kind of reputation, and that has regularly happened, look out, you'll have a house full several times over because we're living in a culture that is seeking truth. They don't even know it, and they're seeking God, and they might not even know it. But I pray that God will make it known that we are people who are passionately in love with Him, and we want to worship Him in truth and in spirit. And His presence will be so real at First Sarasota that people know something's going on at 1661 Main Street. There's a movement on Main, and we want to get in on that movement of God. That's what he says here. So we worship him in spirit and truth. In fact, years ago, I heard a preacher say that at their church, they were he was tempted to put on their sign out front, happy hour. Happy hour at First Sarasota is at 10.30 a.m. Now, I know some of you just saying that alone made you nervous. Why? Because the church ought to be the happiest place in town. We serve a risen Savior. He is alive, and He will give life and will change lives forever to all who will just simply come to Him. And we are dispensers of hope at First Sarasota, so we ought to be known as the place where God is showing up. He tells us who we're to worship. But on the other hand, let's go back and talk about old Mr. Critical, our friend Critical. A friend of mine who's a pastor passed this on this past week, and I quote, If you go to church looking to become offended, you will succeed. If you go to church looking for places where people fall short, you will find them. If you go to church looking for imperfection, you'll see it. If you go to church looking for something to complain about, every single time, you'll see it. But... If you go to church looking for an opportunity to worship alongside broken people just like you, you'll find it. If you go to church looking for a place to serve, you'll find one. If you go to church to to, to love people like Jesus loves them, you can. And if you go to church looking for Jesus, you will find him. So show up to church looking for Jesus. And I love the fact that First Sarasota is that kind of place. Now, why should I praise him? Psalm 150, verse 2, praise him for his acts of power, for his surpassing greatness. Now, when you think about the acts of power for the children of Israel, of course, their minds no doubt probably go back to where God brought them out of Egypt, took them to the promised land. For those of us who are followers of Christ, we think about his acts of power. Our minds travel back to 2,000 years ago to a hill outside of the city of Jerusalem where the Son of God took upon himself our sin and died on the cross on our behalf, was buried. And when you think about acts of power, Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. There is not, never has been, never will be a greater act of power than what Jesus did on the cross. And the tomb is empty. So we're to praise him. For his acts of power, we got a whole lot of effort for surpassing greatness. Now, if you're wondering, how can I pass, praise him for his surpassing greatness? Well, let's look around. Look at this beautiful creation. Whether you look out at the Gulf of Mexico and you see the beauty of that water, the beaches that we're blessed to, to, to live and experience, or you go and travel up to the mountains and you see the, the beauty there, you look up and you see the stars. Everywhere you look, we see God's beautiful creation. In fact, all around you this morning, inside this room, look around you. Seriously, please, look to your left, look to your right. You're seeing evidence of God's beautiful creation because all of you were created by God, for God, on purpose, for His purpose. We see the creativeness of our Creator even right here in this room right now. We serve a great God, and He says we need to praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Why? Because there ain't nobody like Him. There ain't nobody like him. Here's your homework assignment. I'm out of time. But jot down Isaiah chapter 45 and go home and check it. Because three different times he says, I am the Lord God of Israel and there is no one like me. None like me. There's none like him. That's that's why we should praise him. And by the way, if you wonder, well, can you give me another reason? Pray well, let me just give you two words. You ready? Jesus saves. Do you believe that? Just a few minutes, we have the opportunity to baptize a young 10-year-old girl named Alessandra. Alessandra attended our vacation Bible school. Then she attended our adventure day camp. Then 
she went on our overnight camp with the group from our church that went to Lake Hill uh, and had an incredible super summer children's camp there. But during that adventure camp, which had 88 children here on our campus Monday through Friday, Alessandra was one of the children who said, yes, I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? And God has done such a great work in her life that she has been emphasizing that in her walk with Jesus. Her parents have seen that that walk with her in her own life. And now her dad has said, you know what? We as a family are going to get involved in church and we want to serve the Lord and worship the Lord together. Can somebody praise God for that? That is what it's all about. Because the Bible says this, if you look at Luke chapter 15, look at Luke chapter 15 real quickly, and we're going to get ready to close. Luke chapter 15, he says, I tell you, in the same way, Luke 15, 7, there will be more rejoicing, everybody say more rejoicing, in heaven over how many, how many, one more time, one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Luke 15, 10. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over how many? One sinner who repents. Luke 10, 20. However, do not rejoice in the Spirit of you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It sounds like to me there's always reasons to rejoice when people come to faith in Christ. Even when one comes to faith, heaven rejoices. Heaven praises God when God's people see Him work and move in and through their lives, and lives are forever changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was saying, well, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the positive signs. How about the low valleys? He's worthy of our praise. Now, the text here, and we're out of time, tells us. I'm just going to look at these, Psalm 150, 33. Just, just throw them up on the screen real fast. He says this. It tells us how we're to praise him. Praise him on the trumpet. Praise him on the harp. The lyre, verse 4, of the timbrel, and with dancing. So, obviously, the writer wasn't a Baptist. Let me just keep moving. Uh, the, 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 the idea there, of course, is one of joy, right? One of joy. If I say joy, nothing bad, nothing bad. But timbrel, dancing, strings, pipe, clash of cymbals, resounding cymbals. Sounds like, to me, a beautiful orchestra lifting praise to God. And I love how he ends it. In verse number five, or verse number six, let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Did you know that when a cow says moo, what he is saying is praise the Lord? When that rooster gets up in the morning and starts to calling out. You know what that rooster's saying? Praise the Lord. That old filthy snake doesn't even know it, but when that snake is throwing out his tongue, you know what that tongue's really saying? Say it with me. Praise the Lord. When that frog starts croaking, you know what that croak is saying? Say it with me. When that gator starts to growl, what is it saying? That dog starts to bark, what is it saying? Yeah, you, you get it. It's got breath in it. It's praise the Lord, except for humanity. Because we're sinners in need of a Savior. And here's the thing, when you have Christ in your heart, your name's written in glory. That's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 10. He says, you rejoice when your name is written down in heaven. So this morning, if you have nothing else to rejoice about, listen carefully. You rejoice over that. And there are going to come times in your life where you might not think you have any other reason to praise Him. One of the most powerful Examples of praise that I've ever witnessed personally happened about five years ago. I got a text early in the morning. A dear young man that my wife and I love had been murdered during the night. Incredible young man of God, very close to my own children. Incredible keyboard player, 
in our church, senior in college last semester, then going to law school. Love the Lord, love people. My heart sank for his mother, his siblings. Just a year or two earlier, his father had suddenly dropped dead. He knew the Lord, he was in heaven. This young man, Jonathan, is now in heaven. Went over to the home to visit with his mother, with some of our family. As soon as I walked in, the house began to speak with his godly mother. She lifts her hands. And this was her prayer in tears. I bless you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I glorify you, Lord. Over and over and over. course, we're talking to the children, doing our best to love on them, pray for, pray with, cry with. Those are the kind of things that are extraordinarily difficult for every one of us. And in the midst of the darkest valley a mother can walk through, this is the legion. five years ago. I'm sure she's in church somewhere today worshiping Jesus. She and the rest of her kids are in church somewhere today worshiping Jesus. And we were fortunate to have one of her children today help lead us in worshiping Jesus. I apologize to put you on the spot. Nigga, would you stand? I just want y'all to see this young man. I love you, buddy. By the way, Nick is now the oldest. He's loving on, encouraging his family, praising Jesus. And by the way, he's answered God's call to ministry. He is preparing. He is preparing for ministry at our Baptist College of Florida online. And has how much more time? About a year. About a year and he's going to graduate. So when you think about, can I praise God with what I'm going through? Why don't you remember and allow God to use this to your family to encourage you that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, God is bigger than everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Would you bow for prayer? And I don't know what you're going through, but night and day, day and night, that song that we learned today said, let incense arise. Revelation speaks of the incense of God, the incense of God's people, perhaps even our prayers. Because he and he alone is worthy of our glory. And I don't know what you're dealing with today and what you're facing. And maybe today you would say, I'm on the mountaintop. And I give God praise and I rejoice with you. But maybe, just maybe today, you're walking through a very deep valley. And as soon as you heard me begin talking about praising and being positive, perhaps in your mind, it's all easy for him to say. And you're right, it is. But the goodness of our great God is worthy of our praise. And the Bible's filled with stories of people who praise their way through pain. Mrs. Delicious and her dear family, who my wife and I have known for many, many years, are an example modern day of what it's like to praise God through the pain. And does it make life to where there's no problems? No. But do they still look to the goodness of God? Yes. And he's bringing them through it. So would you, wherever you are, right here or at home, just bow and say, Lord, I'm going to choose to praise you. I'm going to choose to trust you. 
and I'm asking you to give me a positive, passionate, praise heart. Heart of praise. No matter what's happening in my life, I'm going to praise you, Lord, and watch you take care of the problems and see me through it. Or if you're on the mountaintop today, would you just say, Lord, I want to praise you, Lord. I want to thank you for what you brought me through and how you're at work in my life today and how you have worked in the past. Would you take a moment and pray that? And maybe you're here today and you've never chose to follow Christ. Would you pray right now and admit, first of all, you sinned. The Bible says we all have. And ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and place your faith and hope and trust in Him. And the Bible says, your calls in His name will be saved. And friend, the most negative, pessimistic place that will ever exist is outside of God's presence in a real place called hell, not designed for you, but the devil and his angels. But if you go there, you have gone because you chose to say no to God's love. I implore you, please don't say no to God and His love. Open your heart to Him today. And just say, Jesus, today I ask you to come into my life. Give me eternal life. May my life never, ever be the same again. Cleanse me, change me. Make me your child. And then lastly, as a church, do we pray that we'll be known as a praising church that's filled with spirit, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, according to his word. And that God's manifest presence becomes so known here because of him at work within us. That as Christ is lifted up, he would draw others to him. Father, we thank you for your word. You and you alone deserve our praise. You're worthy of it all. And Lord, your word reminded us of that today. And we know every good thing is from you, through you, by you, for you, and ultimately to you. We give it back to you. You deserve the glory. And I ask that today, as we continue to worship you through giving, that God, our gifts will remind us that you are worthy of it all. Thank you for your love in our lives and for your goodness to us. May our lives be filled with positive praise for you and help us get our focus off of ourselves where pessimism and negativity abounds. We pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Well, thank you.